also recording. So I can shave off a chunk of the beginning of the recording if I have to uh, uh, before I upload it. So let's see here. We have five attendees so far, more than five. Awesome, very cool. 10 attendees. Hi everybody, welcome while you're getting your audio uh, 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 set up so you can hear us. It's 11.55 uh, here in Houston, so we're starting at about five minutes. So it's 1157. We've got about three minutes and then we'll get started. I see folks from New Orleans, from Illinois, from Colleen. Hey. Illinois, like us. Yes. I was Googling DeKalb and uh, um, was looking at pictures of that uh, Egyptian theater. Uh, yeah. It's really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> They've been doing a, uh, or and starting too, a fairly significant renovation process, uh, kind of an ongoing process with old theaters like that. All right, it's 11.58, so we've got two minutes, gang. Thanks for joining us. We have 20 attendees. Most of whom are people. One is a center, uh, uh, so maybe there are multiple people tuning in uh, out there. That's great. About one minute. <clears throat> All right.
We have one person who managed to call in to listen. Looks like it. Great. All right, I've got noon uh, now, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, uh, to our first uh, uh, webinar of 2017. Uh, uh, this one uh, is on authentic learning, experiential and inquiry-based learning in online and blended courses. Um, uh, uh, we are very excited to bring these to you uh, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, more uh, um, uh, this year and uh, uh, getting together with maybe all, or, or at least most of you, uh, at the Pod Network Conference uh, uh, later. My name is George Dedebo, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence at the University of Houston downtown. Uh, uh, I'm here uh, uh, today uh, uh, as the chair of the Special Interest Group on Teaching with Technology uh, that's a part of the Professional and Organizational Development Network, the POD Network. Uh, uh, and I'll go ahead and uh, begin. So we have some additional officers in our SIG, in our special interest group. Uh, we've got Nick Yates, who's joining us from Abu Dhabi. He's our chair-elect. Um, uh, we also have Julia Sue, uh, uh, who is our past chair uh, uh, over at Caltech. And uh, last conference in Louisville, uh, uh, Louisville is what, how you're supposed to say it, apparently. So uh, uh, we elected some at-large uh, uh, officers also. So we've got Michael Johnson from uh, Brigham Young, Stephanie, uh, who's with us today uh, uh, from Northern Illinois, and uh, Robin Sullivan from University of Buffalo. So uh, uh, thanks to all those great folks uh, uh, for working uh, uh, with me so diligently to put these things uh, uh, together. So that's who we are, I already said. Uh, I'll share these slides with you uh, after the uh, event. Um, you can find more information about our special interest group at that WordPress site. It's just uh, safetywt.wordpress.com. So join us there. Um, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get cranked up. Uh, uh, if uh, You shouldn't be able to have your uh, microphone or camera on, but if you do, uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, make sure they're turned off uh, uh, so we don't get any uh, interference. There's a Q&A window, uh, uh, so you should be able to type your questions in the Q&A window, as opposed to the chat window. Uh, uh, chat is just kind of informal, hello, back and forth uh, uh, stuff. Uh, Q&A uh, uh, will be uh, where Nick uh, is going to be uh, uh, actively fishing uh, uh, for good questions uh, uh, to share uh, uh, with our esteemed panelists. So we're recording this uh, uh, as well. We'll let you know when the recording's uh, ready. Um, uh, speaking of the recording, we'll also have a transcript uh, uh, of today uh, uh, um, brought to us uh, um, due to generous funding uh, from POD uh, itself. So they're going to be paying for the transcription uh, of this and our next uh, uh, webinar. So on to uh, uh, why we're all here today. So we've got two great panelists. Uh, 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 our first is Stephanie Richter. She's the Assistant Director uh, of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. Uh, uh, and uh, as the Assistant Director for the Faculty Development Instructional Design Center at NIU, uh, she consults with and offers programs for faculty on integrating technology into teaching for face-to-face, -face, blended, and online courses. Uh, uh, she's an alumnus, or alumna, uh, of the Institute for Emerging Leaders in Online Learning. She's a Quality Matters Certified Reviewer uh, and Facilitator and a Blackboard MVP. And uh, uh, we are so delighted to have her here uh, um, not just as a panelist, by the way, but also as an at-large uh, officer of uh, our city. So um, send her good vibes and thoughts because she's working on her doctorate uh, in instructional uh, uh, technology uh, as well. So our other great panelist uh, is Tracy Miller. Uh, Tracy and Stephanie work together, uh, uh, and Tracy is the online teaching coordinator um, uh, of the Faculty Development Instructional Design Center at the same place. Um, uh, and that's at NIU, Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois University. She's responsible for program planning, programs, and consultations on integrating technology into teaching. She, she also authored a chapter on scaling inquiry-based teaching through faculty development in inquiry-based learning for faculty and institutional development, a conceptual and practical resource for educators. So that's a great publication uh, uh, for you to go to for more uh, information. So um, she's been uh, uh, giving professional development, giving her all uh, 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 for over 12 years uh, 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 at her job. So welcome, uh, uh, Tracy and Stephanie. 
So um, before we um, uh, uh, switch over uh, to some questions, I've got some uh, polls that I'll be throwing out every once in a while. And it's time uh, for a quick uh, uh, audience poll so you can just get a feel um, uh, for um, uh, how the polls work. So our first poll uh, uh, is just a quick question for you uh, to vote on. So um, uh, do you teach hybrid or online courses? Uh, uh, select your answer. like that's tapered off uh, a little bit. So um, uh, uh, we've got uh, a lot of people who teach both. Most people have uh, uh, teach both uh, uh, over a quarter online, over a third online. Uh, uh, some hybrid, uh, uh, a lot of folks teach uh, neither uh, as well. So uh, very cool. So that's your uh, uh, results uh, right there. So that's how polls uh, we're going to work. We're going to keep you uh, uh, stimulated and active and, and make you participate. Uh, uh, you're not just listening to a bunch of talking heads uh, uh, the whole time. So thanks for that. So uh, um, on with the show. Uh, then with our next slide uh, uh, is our first uh, question to our panelists. And uh, Tracy's going to take this one. And uh, that question specifically is, what is experiential or inquiry-based uh, learning? And I'm going to let uh, uh, Tracy control the universe uh, uh, here. So, uh, um, um, if I warned you about this. Itself, it's all your fault, Tracy. Uh, 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 so you should be able to take it away now, I think. Tracy, try that. Okay. It popped up for a second there. There you are. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly go over um, our definitions of an authentic experience or an experiential or inquiry based experience, just sort of so we have the same sort of working definition. So, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, I'm getting nods from my co panelists here. So, um, I actually pulled out this definition from Wikipedia. Sometimes it just works, and it was it was really clear definition here. I'm not going to read it to you um, word for word, but I think this idea of an authentic experience really works for the other things we're talking about, like experiential and inquiry-based learning. They all have these characteristics. So it's really about um, learners constructing their own meaning, uh, a very constructivist approach approach um, when we're talking about authentic experiences. They're also um, authentic because they're real world. These are things that students will run into maybe as a professional or just as sort of a developing human being. Um, they're also um, often problem-centered um, or project-based. Um, and that way they're, um, they really become relevant to the learner because they feel like um, they're taking an actionable um, approach to their learning. And it's also something that they're also asked to reflect on. So how are they learning? What are they learning? Um, so these are all the, the sort of terms and, and things we throw out when we're talking about an authentic experience with our students. And really that's either, um, face-to-face -face or online. I'm kind of hovering over my, ah, there we go. <laughs> it goes away when you're not on it, so it's weird. Okay, so here's another um, way of kind of looking at this authentic learning. Um, and this is from the Journal of Authentic Learning, and it's these four characteristics um, that you may find in an authentic learning task. Um, again, it centers around real world problems. Um, it's something that they're going to see as professionals. Um, number two is where we start getting into that inquiry-based learning um, and really talking about what it means to have this open-ended inquiry. Um, my quick definition of inquiry-based learning is whenever you're having students ask questions and um, allowing them to sort of solve it on their own. 
Um, and of course, that's going to really address those higher level thinking skills and even that metacognition. So that um, thinking about thinking and how they're learning. Um, next, number three, students will engage in discourse in social learning. Any type of authentic learning has that component of um, social constructivism or social cognition where they're learning by interacting through each other. So another important characteristic of authentic learning. And then it's always very student directed, um, if done well, of course. Um, students are going to be more responsible um, in an authentic learning situation for their own learning. Now I can see the bottom of, I think, there you go. There we go. <laughs> the bottom of your screen. Um, so how do you go about planning an authentic um, learning task or authentic learning experience? So whenever I um, think about this, I like to make sure I stay grounded in um, some, some basic ways you would create any sort of um, learning experience. And so first of all, you want to think about the outcome. Um, what do you want students to be able to do? Um, what do you want them walk, walking away being able to do? So you want to start with your learning objectives. Um, and we always talk a lot about this. Um, we don't want to f deviate away from our learning objectives um, just because we might be trying um, a new approach or even uh, moving things online. Um, who's going to define these learning um, objectives because sometimes in a really open um, inquiry-based experience, it may be the students that are having some more input on um, what those learning objectives are going to be. So you need to define that early on when you're thinking about these experiences. Um, next, context. Um, where will the students go? Um, do you pick the location that they're going to go to or do they pick the location that they're going to. Again, important concept in an online environment um, because you're not in the same place or the same time necessarily. Um, so setting that context is important um, early on and in, in when you're kind of developing these tasks. Um, assessment. Um, you always want to be able to, to measure their achievement of the learning ad objectives, um, but how are they going to do that and how are you going to sort of assess their work? Um, is it going to be a tangible product? Um, are you going to have them use um, journaling notes or um, a more formalized kind of paper? Are they going to use some type of media? You know, are they going to be um, filming their experience, for instance? All of these are components that um, you need to think about when you're planning these um, experiences. And then technology, uh, you know, especially in that online environment. Um, what will the students need um, to complete this sort of authentic task? Um, and really the, the sky's the, the limit. Are they going to need lab equipment? Are they going to be able to use their mobile devices? Um, do they need to, some sort of specialized equipment? You just want to kind of think about all those different variables um, when planning uh, an authentic task such as this. So here's my example, just kind of um, wrap your heads around it. Let's say you want your students to um, analyze the health of a local pond. And so I've come up with these base pairs on um, how you might design an authentic experience for your students this way. And so um, very simplified example, they're analyzing the health of a local pond. So first of all, what kind of technology do you want them to use? Um, are you going to identify the proper equipment for them or do they need to identify the proper equipment to uh, take some water samples in a local pond and the local pond is the context. Um, 
So the t context could vary though. Maybe it's not a local pond. Maybe it's going to be a stream or an ocean or, or a larger body of water like a lake. Um, whatever that context is, you need to sort of decide on that for your students or say you're going to really open it up again and uh, maybe allow them um, to pick that context. Again, they could be in different locations. So you're not all going to your local pond. Um, the students are going to their local pond. And so again, to kind of just further expand this example here, um, what kind of assessment are you going to, to look for from your students? Um, and specifically, you want to know um, how well they um, went through these sampling procedures. And maybe that's just your short-term outcome. Uh, maybe a uh, kind of a longer form assessment is going to be, how are they going to then um, analyze uh, the samples that they took? So that's basically how you can structure um, this inquiry-based project um, with your sort of overall learning objective of um, your students being able to analyze the health of a local pond. So please feel free to um, ask any questions or put them in the question and answer area so that um, Nick can kind of gather them for you and I can give you more ex um, information on the example I provided. I'm going through this sort of quickly, but I want to get to more of these other questions. Um, on how you can add um, inquiry-based experiences onto your, into your online course. But I did want to talk a little bit about this inquiry-based spectrum. I always think about inquiry-based experiences on a spectrum. Uh, it's not the idea of you are either doing inquiry-based um, experiences or not. It usually falls out on some sort of um, spot on the spectrum. Um, so I'm going to start with the left hand side, which is a very directed experience. And a directed experience um, is going to be almost like um, your typical lab procedure where um, it's going to be much more faculty centered. That's, that's why we have the two arrows here with the sort of delivery and approach. Um, the, the faculty is really going to make most of the decisions for the students in that case. I'm going to tell them exactly what type of materials they need, maybe even outline an exact procedure that they need to follow. Uh, very um, prescriptive, but still kind of let the, the students um, find out the answers for themselves. We're going to move into the next, a little bit over to the right, with this idea of a guided inquiry project. It's more um, similar to what I just described in my um, sampling a local pond example, um, where you're going to let the students pick some of the things that they're going to look at, maybe because we didn't even decide what they're going to be sampling for. So maybe some students are going to be sampling for the pH value and other students are going to be maybe sampling for the oxygen levels in a local pond. Uh, it's, it's just becoming a little bit more and more student-centered. Um, and we're giving students more options um, to kind of choose their own adventure at this point. And we're going to move over a little bit more. And um, we're, it's still structured. Um, the faculty member is um, still going to be picking some, some variables here. But we're still kind of broadening them and, and moving into more and more of that open inquiry. And um, the idea of the open inquiry is really when it's um, really student driven, um, the students may be um, then finding out about their own sampling procedures, um, they may um, go off track a little bit and maybe they're comparing uh, the pH values from a local pond um, to a local stream and and the the questions that they're asking that they want to know the answers to um, are much more in the control of the students at that point. Um, so that is basically my my definition my answer to um, what we might be um, 
looking for when we're talking about authentic learning experiences and um, inquiry-based education. So we're ready for the next question. Yeah, all right, so thank you. So uh, while Tracy's um, giving me control back of the universe, uh, uh, I'll move on uh, <laughs> uh, to the next question. The next question too, and we'll direct this one to Stephanie first. So Stephanie, what drew you to this approach? Uh, uh, what do you find uh, attractive and impactful uh, about it? Well, for one, um, I think what, what drew us to this approach for online courses was probably our focus as an institution on using the um, the AACNU's uh, high impact practices, and I'll find a reference for that and put that in the um, the text chat in a moment. But so the, the high impact practices were a big focus for us a few years ago as an institution as we were pursuing a Carnegie classification for an engagement university uh, and looking at how we incorporated students within our community engagement for that. So, and, and building the rationale for why these and other of the, the HIPs were so important for our students. For me personally, uh, I, have, I have a couple of stories that relate that I'll tell really short, really quickly. Uh, when I was doing my master's degree, I, it was not an online program, but because it's instructional technology, a few of the faculty were of course using uh, technology to teach with and, and some teaching fully online courses. Most of the courses were great, face-to-face -face or online, but I had a couple that were what the faculty who are opposed to online teaching think online courses have to be, right? They were very, very static, read a chapter from a book. Um, they didn't have, we didn't have any tutorials like online lectures then, but read a chapter, do a discussion board, read a chapter, do it every week. And as we were learning about online teaching and using technology, it just seemed like such a, a waste of opportunity. So when I uh, had the experience with another online course that was an advanced instructional design course done online and actually kind of blended, we had a few meetings, uh, a beginning and an end that kind of capped the course face to face. But uh, it was all project based. We were working with clients, uh, actual companies with their training departments to develop training, um, face to face or online training that would actually be delivered to their employees. So it was a little inquiry based, a little project based, a little problem based, uh, really what I would call is just authentic, experiential at the end of the day. And it was so much more meaningful and the, the connections we made in working with these partners, working with each other collaboratively within the course were so much more meaningful. Uh, on the flip side, as a faculty developer, the other piece that really cemented my desire to go this way was um, I was working with a faculty member who was in the School of Nursing. She was trying to bring a face-to-face -face course online for the first time, had never taught online before. And as we were discussing her plans and her approach about this course, which was on um, ethical and moral decision-making in nursing, uh, we were talking about her face-to-face -face course and what she what worked well and what she loved about it. One of the most impactful activities, she said, was that she had them engage in a debate. So gave them a topic and a side and the students in their teams had to research the, the, that position for that topic and make an argument for why that should be the way that nursing practice is. And then debate with their classmates who are on the opposite side and, and actually go through a rebuttal. Um, and a voting exercise face-to-face -to, -face to see which side had been more persuasive, which side were the other students going to um, approach with. So she loved this activity face-to-face, -face, and she goes, but I can't do it online, so I guess I'll just give them another test. <laughs> and my jaw hit the ground, and I was so disappointed that that was the direction she was going to go, that she had this really rich inquiry and, uh, although fairly directed inquiry activity, but... Um, that she was going to replace with a multiple choice exam because she didn't think you could do that online. So we had a lot of conversations about different approaches and how to do that. And uh, because she was nervous, I ended up sitting next to her as she um, worked through uh, using web conferencing in order to actually have a debate. Her students loved it. We had I don't think we had any technical issues in the end, which is what she was so afraid of. And she found that it still had the same, um, the same impacts for her students. Uh, 
because they were still researching, they were still uh, building arguments, and they still got to debate. Um, so that experience of, of talking to someone who was going to take out all of the, the excellent, um, authentic problem um, project team in uh, inquiry learning from her course because, well, online courses can't do that, um, was what really, I think, transformed my perspective on we can't assume that faculty know that they can do this. And, and I think as faculty developers, if you're working with faculty who are teaching online, that's something to be aware of and something to um, try to make them aware of, that this is a possibility and it can happen and it can be quite impactful for those students that's a great response i think i had the same reaction uh, uh, to the topic uh, um, myself i think about a year ago um, i don't know if you remember there was a meme pic going around uh, 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 on the internet of these kids in a museum and they're all sitting uh, uh, on a bench in a museum and there's all this fabulous artwork all around them but nobody's looking at the artwork they're all looking at their phones and I shared it on my Facebook page um, uh, just to kind of test the waters and see uh, what the responses would be from people. And of course, you got the, oh, those millennials, you know, they don't know how to appreciate the real world. And uh, I saw it as uh, um, uh, that kind of setting where maybe they were doing some learning on site uh, uh, at the museum. They just happened to be researching the artist or something like that, you know. Uh, so it kind of expands. Uh, um, uh, uh, your interpretation uh, here. So um, uh, anybody uh, uh, have any questions to add to this, go ahead and type them up in the Q&A window. I'll turn to uh, uh, Tracy to see if we can get a, a reaction from her on what drew uh, uh, you to this approach. Tracy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, uh, previous to coming to Northern Illinois, uh, I worked for nine years at the Illinois Math and Science Academy, uh, and their entire approach is inquiry-based teaching. So they basically, they, they call themselves an um, educational laboratory for imagination and inquiry. Wow. It almost sounds a little Disney-esque, but, <laughs> but they truly believe it. Um, and so that, you know, I was kind of it, it just immersed in that atmosphere um, for so long. And not, and not just because, um, you know, I had to. It was, it was something that um, I was and still am very passionate about. Um, but also during that time, I was an online student, and uh, one of my experiences as a full-time online student um, was a semester that I actually did on the history and art of wine, um, if you can believe it. And so as sort of this um, potentially insulated um, online student, uh, you know, you really think about it as you're just always in front of a um, computer and and you're not necessarily experiencing the real world but in my case um, I was able to um, leave my the front of my computer and um, visit um, vineyards and uh, do some wine tasting and uh, you know talk to vintners and even explore um, some artwork and um, things that um, have kind of transpired over the years on on winemaking and um, so the whole experience to me was uh, was very authentic and really lasted with me um, for a really long time uh, because I was able to totally um, immerse myself in this study. Um, so much so that one of the uh, regions that I was studying about is the Rhone River in France um, because they have some amazing viticulture um, that, you know, has developed over the last 500 years. So um, last year I went and visited that region and it, it really just brought the whole experience to me full circle to be out to see those great vines and, and to experience um, that culture out there. So uh, between that professional experience and then that personal experience, um, I'm just completely um, hooked on authentic um, online learning that way. Well, you had me at wine. So, <laughs> so uh, in the chat window, by the way, Chris uh, 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 from Notre Dame just posted a link uh, 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 to uh, 
that photo that I was uh, uh, talking about. Thank you for those great oh, uh, awesome. uh, personal connections uh, uh, to uh, uh, the approach. So it um, uh, doesn't look like we have any additional uh, uh, questions, so we're going to move on um, uh, and talk about um, um, how this takes shape in the online environment. Switch back over to uh, uh, Stefan here to tell us about that. Sure. Um, so for, for the online environment, honestly, I think less changes than what you might expect because for most of our face-to-face -face courses um, that would use something like an authentic or inquiry-based or experiential approach, I think by now we've adopted a lot of online technologies to supplement at the very least uh, those types of courses so that students have more resources on hand uh, when they're ready to engage. Um, but the, the point is, as Tracy said before, to be sure that the, um, the learning experiences themselves, the, the learning outcomes, don't change just because you're moving to the online environment. Again, the, the story about the, the nursing course um, and whether or not to include that debate is a really relevant one. Uh, it's all too tempting to try to minimize uh, complications in an online environment or decrease the uh, the complexity of our courses so that they are are simpler to facilitate particularly if you're in an environment where multiple um, instructors potentially adjuncts are teaching those online courses you want something that is easy to hand off and easy for someone else to step into but at the same time uh, we're all responsible for not degrading the quality of the um, the online experience. For an online course, Tracy alluded to as well with her, her pond example that students, while we do know that most students who are taking online courses are doing so from an institution fairly close to where they live, uh, just because of the, the trust in local names and local institutions. Um, at the same time, online students may be quite dispersed. So you're not likely to bring them to the same site together as you might for a field experience. Um, and you are, or your faculty, are not likely to have connections in their communities in order to um, facilitate sites or, or um, those experiential learning opportunities. Instead, I think it's the responsibility of a faculty to leverage networks when they can and provide guidance for students in finding and selecting a, an appropriate location. Um, again, similar for what we would do in face-to-face -face courses, if you had a project where students had to find their own topic or their own location, um, you might be more inclined to uh, approve those at some point, right? Go through an iterative process where students identify a site or a location or a partner to work with for their inquiry or experiential project, and then submit something early on in order to gain approval. Um, I have a, it's more of a project-based course than it is an inquiry-based course, but uh, I teach a course on evaluation in educational settings, and the course itself is built around a, an evaluation proposal where students are drafting a proposal as they go, and I have them turn in, very first thing, a uh, prospectus that says, after I've given you some guidance on what would make a good project location, you tell me where you selected, what is the location like, what is the, um, the actual problem or need, and how does that evolve into your evaluation plan. That's a great opportunity for me very early to determine if they're on the right track or not so that I can provide supports and scaffolds as they go. I think that guidance is really important in an online course and is a big part of the community of inquiry model of teacher and social and student presence, bringing those pieces together so that the, the student does feel supported and feels like they're not, as Tracy mentioned, they're not feeling on their own, which again is all too common. Uh, and then the biggest thing I think in an online course, if you're trying to use experiential or inquiry-based learning is using some creativity in the design. Thinking about what you can do 
virtually via a, a web conference or uh, via a simulation. If students can turn in a product that's maybe a different format than you might be used to, instead of bringing something in physical, maybe they have to document that in some way, or uh, via video or photography, the use of audio, I think, is often underrated because we have a tendency to go straight to um, audio first, or straight to video first, as the snazzier um, format. But again, looking at all of these new ways that you might use technology to have students present or share their findings with each other um, so that you can have the same experience but ultimately, scaffolding, support, guidance, I think all of that is really critical in these types of courses. Great, thank you. So um, uh, we have a couple of audience uh, uh, questions that I wanted to um, uh, bounce off of you both. So uh, uh, the first comes from uh, an anonymous attendee who wants to know, how do you promote students taking responsibility for learning? So um, you wanna start with that? Uh, Tracy, you wanna take that first? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, I saw that question come in and Stephanie was was answering it in some ways a little bit already. And I think um, that's one of the things. It's, it's that that coaching skills, you know, that you're um, you're scaffolding the learning for them and, and giving them um, different milestones and checkpoints um, to kind of to keep that inquiry moving. Um, but I'll also say that one of the things that really um, help promote those students taking responsibility is this could be a question that they've developed themselves. And if that's a question that they already sort of want to know the answer to, uh, they're going to be more motivated to, um, to seek out those answers. And so that's one of the, the beautiful things about inquiry-based learning is that, um, you know, everyone, if it, if it truly is an authentic experience and um, something that the students want to know the answer to, uh, they're going to take on that responsibility um, for their own learning. Um, if you remember back to... Um, one of my earlier screens where they had, I had that directed on the right hand side and that faculty centered, and then it was moving towards a, a more student centered approach. Um, the idea behind that is, is that, yeah, you want to take them from more of a um, directed, guided experience that maybe they're more comfortable with at first and that they're not quite taking on all the responsibility themselves um, and kind of move that into that direction of, um, okay, now you're going to be a little bit more self-directed, um, but here's how I'm going to coach you through it. Um, and there's the, the basics of just, you know, do they want to be assessed? Do they want to be graded um, on this? Um, they'll do it if you grade them. <laughs> Great. Another question, uh, uh, this one's from the chat window from a couple of posts in the chat window. I'm kind of cobbling them together, uh, but it has to do, um, uh, uh, grosso modo, with uh, a synchronous uh, group discussion activity wherein the instructor is having difficulty um, getting 100% participation uh, um, uh, in the activity. Um, the course is a fully online course. It's set up in such a way that nobody's really required to be at a specific place at a specific time throughout the semester. So uh, uh, what are some alternatives or ways um, uh, to boost participation in that synchronous uh, group discussion activity? Uh, I'll take this one, um, and I think having read through the, the description, um, a couple of other things that I might throw into this for um, the person who had asked, there's no doubt that uh, scheduling of synchronous sessions in an online course can be really difficult, partially because of the expectation from students that online course means that they can do it whenever they want to, there's no specific time to come together. Um, and a synchronous session, of course, belies that right away. Our School of Nursing, for example, has dropped synchronous sessions from their courses because nursing, from most of their courses, because nursing students have, uh, their graduate students in particular, are working nurses and finding time to come together um, when they have such hectic schedules and such uh, conflicting schedules is practically impossible. Um, and she went on to say that her students have found um, when they're asked to do things that are a little 
more challenging, like um, higher order thinking on, on tests or synchronous sessions that there, there's some um, resistance to that. Uh, and she finds herself explaining quite a bit why, why, why on a lot of these, um, these topics. And I'll say I, I found the same, but I found that to be valuable and, and not particularly a waste of time, even though it does take a lot of time. Because um, particularly with the graduate students that you have, and even with, with younger students, a lot of principles of, of andragogy and adult learning tell us that the motivation for learning has to be, uh, and for learning activities, has to be relevant to the learner. So explaining why an activity is useful and what that's going to connect them to uh, can really be a significant means of, of motivating them to engage with it. I had students outright rebel one semester on discussion boards as grad students that they didn't think they needed to do them. They didn't know what value they were. Uh, and it crushed me because the semester before, when I taught the course, I didn't have any. And my students complained that they didn't get to talk to each other and didn't get to connect. So I added them in and can't ever make all the students happy. <laughs> That's, I think, something we've all learned. But anyhow, to cut my rambling short, Explaining the rationale as, as she's been doing, as you've been doing, I think is a great thing to try to uh, continue doing. And also to help, if possible, have students generate some of that too. Um, I had an entire course where students didn't understand why they needed to take it. And coming from a math education background, you get that question so often. Why do I need to know Pythagoras? Why do I need this? And so being fed up with knowing that none of my answers ever worked, I made students tell me for this course, why is this course relevant to you? And you can't say it isn't. Find some reason why it is relevant. What is it going to teach you? And every single person did, and I didn't get a single complaint that semester for why they needed to do this. Um, that helped immensely. From the synchronous part, I would say uh, the synchronous sessions can be, of course, really powerful for students to come together and discuss. But we've also been experimenting with um, other tools that are asynchronous but provide a better sense of connection. Um, if you haven't looked at Flipgrid, for example, it's a video-based discussion board, works in the browser, works from a mobile phone, and has free options to use. We've been, like I said, just starting to experiment with it, and I don't know if any of our um, faculty are using it in their courses yet, but it has seemed to be really uh, a fairly straightforward and simple means of getting that that deeper connection one when you have a visual representation and, and the audio instead of text on a discussion board. But because it is asynchronous, it's a little more convenient to students. I would look um, at other technology solutions that might help with that too. If I could add one quick thing uh, that I've learned in my own online teaching uh, um, with regards to uh, having synchronous events. I try to um, craft the synchronous uh, event activities in such a way that they're far more appealing than the alternative assignment, right? Uh, um, uh, <laughs> the alternative assignment, maybe it's not drudgery, uh, uh, maybe it's not torture, you know, um, um, but uh, there's a lot more value uh, and fun uh, uh, in going to uh, uh, the synchronous assignment. But there is a way to earn uh, the grade if you can't uh, uh, do it. So um, I found that works uh, uh, pretty well uh, in my own. One more question uh, uh, that I've seen here in the chat window, guys, and thanks for pointing these out, uh, uh, Nick. Um, uh, and that's uh, having to do with, uh, um, since we're sending students uh, um, uh, into the community, um, to a pond, uh, 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 wherever, um, uh, um, are there any um, institutional policies uh, in place um, uh, that would apply uh, for these uh, um, new kinds of learning environments uh, uh, where um, students aren't used to going? in terms of safety, uh, uh, et cetera, right? So what if there's an ax murderer at the pond? So uh, I think that's, that's the, <laughs> behind the question. So uh, uh, Tracy, do you want to uh, add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say it would be, now I can't think of any particular policy, but it would be similar to um, sort of that field trip policy or that um, community-based um, 
experience that you would have. So here we have an office of um, experiential learning and they would probably be the, the body that we would work with in order to say, okay, we're going to have a group of students um, go into um, you know, any kind of community-based experience and uh, what, what is the paperwork that we need. Uh, but there's definitely some um, considerations when you're not really um, sure where they're, they're landing. So I would say that if there's any real safety concerns like that, you probably want to build up um, sort of a reciprocal deal with um, other sort of organizations like that where um, potentially your students can go to you know that location and if there was sort of local students where you were you could sort of um, take in those students or at least give some recommendations of um, some some safe areas to go to and we uh, here at UHD uh, have a similar uh, office that we can go to where there's kind of a list of pre-approved proven partners and places uh, 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 that was a lot of peace uh, uh, to go to uh, 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 to uh, deploy this kind of uh, uh, learning in your courses so. Well, and I'll add to this too, just briefly, because the one of the bigger concerns is almost um, what's acceptable, not from a safety perspective, but from a, a, a licensure perspective. So, um, you know, if we have School of Nursing students who need a site to visit, that site would need to meet specific guidelines to be accepted for clinical hours under their um, their program for licensure. That's one of the, the requirements as well under the, the state authorization reciprocity agreement, Sarah, yeah. is that you're very clear with your students about what those requirements would be and what, what states you would be, or countries, you would be authorized to license that student to actually serve in. There is a very high powered microscope uh, uh, for nursing courses, uh, no matter the modality. So that's mm -hmm. an important uh, uh, consideration. So um, uh, let's see, I think that's all uh, uh, the questions there. So we're gonna move on uh, uh, for the moment. Remember, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A uh, uh, window, everybody. So uh, another question is um, uh, uh, talking more about those specific technologies, right? So if you don't wanna limit yourselves, panelists, to uh, the LMS uh, itself, that's fine. You wanna talk about uh, things outside the LMS, that's, that's good too. So what technologies are used to support authentic learning online? Well, um, I think we've talked about a few already. Um, one of them would be using a web conferencing tool, um, such as the um, tool we're using Zoom this afternoon, or, or maybe there's other web conferencing tools um, that you know, your university, your institution is more familiar with. Uh, you can use Skype or Google Hangouts, you know, if there is that, um, that necessity to kind of get together um, at the same time, even if you are getting together um, remotely. Um, another couple, you know, we could kind of brainstorming some of the, uh, these ideas. Um, other communication or technique um, connection tools that your students can use. Um, if you've looked at Slack um, or Microsoft Teams um, are some good tools out there for um, collaborating on um, brainstorming, um, document gathering or editing. Um, all of those tools are, are really good for that. And I'll um, jump over Tracy for yeah. a second too to expand because we didn't have this on our brainstorming list. Uh, when you're looking at team-based learning or project-based where students are working together on something, Slack and Microsoft Teams are a great place to start. Uh, Microsoft Teams is integrated in O365 now, which is fabulous if, if you're in an office for education school. But I would also add Trello and um, Microsoft Planner to that mix too, as being another sort of paired set of tools that are very similar, one outside of Microsoft, one in Microsoft, that can help students who are working on projects be organized and coordinated with the other members of their team. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I don't know why we didn't think of those because we, we use tr like Trello, for instance, we use all the time. Um, but don't forget your LMS tools um, like the uh, discussion boards and um, even email and messaging w within the course. Um, again, c keep the students connected and communicating with each other. Um, don't forget your mobile apps. Um, it's great when you're sort of in the field there. Um, you can use um, 
um, you know, GPS or um, any sort of, um, you know, a, a compass or even your calculator, you know, remember those, those tools you have on your mobile device. Um, camera, um, you know, documenting um, your experiences and then um, sh the students can share them um, with you and other members of the course. Um, and then any other um, just-in-time resources that might be available on your mobile device. Um, Stephanie, you want to talk a little bit more about how the students can use their media? Sure. Um, as, as Tracy and I both alluded to, actually, one of the, the advantages of working with an online course when you're doing these types of uh, inquiry and experiential learning is it's more natural to use more um, more digital tools to expand the types of products your students might be turning in. So for example, creating videos, uh, Tracy mentioned the camera on your phone, but also things like Jing or Screencast-O-Matic um, to create short videos of, of software they might be using or short presentations. Uh, we've been using Office Mix quite a bit as a free tool to add narration and audio to PowerPoints. I think it would be Again, really simple for students to use that on their own. Uh, VoiceThread is a great option if you haven't used it. Uh, we don't have a license here at NIU, but again, there's a free account that's fairly simple for students to get started with. And um, Weebly or Google Sites as a way to create a website or WordPress for that matter as well. I think there's a lot of power with authentic experiential inquiry-based learning uh, in having students produce something that is public, that is outside of them, um, so that they're not just creating something for the class and for each other, but creating something as a community good on a particular topic to educate others or inform others or galvanize a movement um, can be much more um, impactful and powerful. And I see that Chris posted in the text about Adobe Spark. It's also a, a really great, really simple tool for students to get started with. All really great options. And I have no doubt but what we'll see more and more um, of these continue to grow. Um, so far things like AR and VR would be more appropriate for uh, like a simulation, or particularly VR, a simulation for students who are taking an online course as opposed to something students might actually create. But I can imagine it's only a amount of time before that becomes something that our students could create and submit for each other even. Um, in the, the looking ahead into, in, into the future of this technology. So we just had a really nice healthy list uh, of uh, uh, technology uh, <laughs> uh, there, both within and without uh, uh, the LMS. Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts, uh, all those web conferencing tools uh, like that. Um, uh, using uh, the student's cell phone uh, uh, itself. Project management tools like Slack or Trello, um, uh, uh, Teams within Office 365. Um, uh, the collaboration tools within the LMS, right? So, or, or the communication engagement tools, discussions, uh, uh, wikis, using the group feature um, uh, uh, within the LMS. Um, uh, I would imagine there's probably some journaling and reflection uh, uh, going on at some point. Oh, absolutely, uh, I would hope. Um, uh, uh, so, um, mobile apps. Uh, uh, using uh, just kind of general utility apps uh, 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 that are available, fortunately, on a smartphone, like GPS, um, uh, calculator, compass, um, uh, the camera, the video, maybe you want to um, uh, do some documenting uh, of what you're doing there, screencasting tools, uh, uh, we mentioned a lot of those, um, uh, uh, collaborative uh, video-based uh, uh, voice board, like VoiceThread, uh, uh, would be a good one if you want to showcase these things, put them all together, put them online, uh, uh, Weebly, Google Sites, uh, uh, WordPress, so um, a lot of those are things uh, uh, that you guys are probably familiar with. So that's what uh, uh, this audience poll uh, question. Time to wake up, everybody. Here's an audience poll. So um, <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, I've got a question here for you. So let me get that just a second. Here we go. Sorry. All right. So, there. so uh, uh, this next one is: Do you use and/or support faculty uh, who use these same technologies uh, already? So you just got a big long list. Uh, um, so, what's your feel uh, uh, for that?
about half of us have voted. like voting is winding down, so I'll end it uh, and share the results. Uh, uh, so um, a lot of us uh, have not only use them, but support uh, uh, faculty. We've got a lot of faculty developers uh, 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 in the audience, uh, uh, so that's pretty cool. So um, let's see here. Moving right along, uh, uh, then we're going to go to uh, another question for our panelists, and that's uh, what have been some of the biggest challenges uh, um, associated uh, um, with this type of learning, deploying it? helping faculty with it, um, uh, and how are these challenges overcome? So Tracy, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, and we're so quickly running out of time, so yeah. I'll try to, <laughs> try to be brief. But I think one of the biggest challenges is um, helping faculty um, give up that control a little bit. Uh, so used to being that um, sort of single source of, of authority and that content expert. And um, so the, the biggest challenge um, becomes that, that sort of a counseling where it's like, it's okay, you know, um, you you may not even know the the right answer to the question that the student's asking. So it it comes down to that just um, helping the faculty give up that that control a little bit and helping them um, to be a better coach in that way and um, scaffolding the students and a lot of what we were talking about before. Um, so the solution um, is is. Um, helping them through that and sometimes that's helping them being more comfortable with the technology somehow that's easier to sort of get at and so if we help them with the technology and the comfort level with that um, then th that trust is built and we're able to help them um, be okay with a little bit less control great thank you so that was pretty succinct. So uh, uh, <laughs> it's a big concept too. So. <laughs> this went for Stephanie this time. So how do you best go about getting buy-in from additional faculty to incorporate uh, this kind of design? This is a, a great question um, and one that uh, perplexes us a little bit um, because for the most part we haven't had to, we have no institutional initiative to push this type of um, learning in online courses or even in our face-to-face -face courses, although we do have a strong institutional preference for any type of authentic learning that um, could be incorporated in classes, whether that's inquiry or experiential or service learning or, like I said, problem, project, team based, any of those different flavors. Um, we have a strong institutional culture of that already, so it's not too much of a, a stretch. But in terms of buy-in for this with online teaching, what we've really struggled with the most is helping faculty who are already bought into authentic learning understand that they can do it online. So from that perspective, we've done a lot of um, raising awareness, showing them different tools that are possible, um, and overall just helping them to know that they have support so that they can do this and they can be successful. For the faculty who teach online and perhaps aren't inclined to this, we do the same things we would do for a face-to-face -face course of sharing um, the benefits, extolling the, the virtues of it, showing examples of how it can be effective, um, and, and generally trying to convince faculty to adopt it as opposed to really getting buy-in. And I think probably the best thing to do from our perspective has been connecting faculty with others who have done this, showing examples from faculty and who can share their stories with one another. Uh, because that, that sort of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration seems to be the, the most powerful for our faculty. Great. All right. So um, uh, we're going to move right along uh, uh, here to another question. Um, uh, I'll skip the poll uh, uh, so we can get more information out of you guys. So one more uh, uh, for you, I think we have time for, and that's how does an online course designed for authentic learning differ from other types of online courses in general, if you had to describe that. So do you want to pick up there? Uh, maybe Tracy? Yeah, and I think um, we've, we've definitely alluded to this as we've been going on, uh, but I think the, uh, the, the most, the the different thing here is that um, 
you're going to have less defined content. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be um, prepackaged or just ready to go because you're just never going to be um, quite sure about uh, what the students, you know, what their questions are going to be, what their authentic experiences are going to like, be like. So that's how um, an inquiry based or an authentic learning might be different than um, a different online course. Um, you also might use different tools. Um, you know, again, we just listed so many different tools that you might have um, in, a, in this type of experience. And so you've really got to broaden your, um, your thoughts on what kind of tools might be used um, in then just, a, again, a sort of a typical online course. And then it, um, it's not that an online course is going to be not that active, but you just know that an authentic um, online course like this is going to be really interactive and it's really going to be using those active learning strategies. And uh, Angela from the chat points out that this impacts retention. So uh, uh, you'll keep more students uh, uh, and you won't have as many who, uh, who drop out or just kind of disconnected uh, uh, in general. So that's a really yeah, I point to make. We agree are completely. We're running out of time here. So um, uh, we have a couple of other questions here. Uh, uh, and um, what I will do is I will have uh, Stephanie and Tracy, if they are so kind, answer these uh, in 25, 50 words or, uh, uh, or less in writing, and I will share those with everybody uh, uh, via email. So those questions include um, uh, considerations for blended learning, um, uh, 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 how do you divide up the time uh, in that setting, and uh, where you can go for more information. They actually- Happy to do that via writing, uh, in absolutely. A slide. Yeah, so, um, uh, and then there's another question in the chat window in the Q&A about accessibility tools that Stephanie answered. So we'll include that uh, for everyone uh, uh, as well. There's a little bibliography uh, uh, here that our panelists were kind enough uh, uh, to uh, uh, provide. And um, we are gonna have another webinar in September that we're putting together. This one's on, uh, um, uh, faculty development resources uh, online uh, uh, with some other uh, panelists, uh, one of whom is me. So um, uh, we'll get that information out uh, uh, to you all via the same channels you discovered uh, uh, this one. Thank you all so much for attending. Please join me in thanking our two awesome panelists, Stephanie and Tracy. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, um, we'll get the recording to you. Come and see us in Montreal at the Pod Network Conference. If you can afford it, uh, 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 come and join us there. Um, uh, we have three sessions, our SIG does, um, uh, uh, and uh, all of those are really fun. Uh, uh, we're a pretty uh, harmless group of people. Uh, for the most part, we're harmless. So uh, um, uh, please join us uh, uh, at the pod conference. Thanks, everyone. And thanks again, Stephanie and Tracy. And thanks to Nick uh, for fishing out the questions. Uh, uh, everybody, take care. Bye, guys. <laughs>